in a way that is inclusive as possible, offering up sharp differences at times, but in as respectful a way as possible. So I'm looking around and wondering why this one has been by far the largest turnout. I'm just curious how many of you have been to previous Jewish Week events? Right. And how many uh, knew about this from, from the paper? Oh, that's very heartening. Uh, so welcome to you all. And I had a couple of theories about why this turnout. Um, one could be that New Yorkers, whether they are Met or Yankee fans, are in denial that the World Series is going on without them. <laughs> so they just don't want to be home watching TV tonight and dealing with reality. Um, it could be that so many of us are conditioned to attending the recent high holiday services during the middle of the week that you just naturally felt yourself gravitating here. Or it could be that you saw the word debate in the Jewish Week ads for tonight's program and you're so used to watching presidential and vice presidential debates over these last weeks and months that you just decided you had to be here. The difference is that at this debate, I suspect that neither speaker will be dropping his G's when speaking. <laughs> or speaking. Uh, but the real reason I suspect for this large turnout is the quality and the reputation of the speakers here. So let me introduce them briefly and explain the format for tonight's program. Uh, obviously, we could read very long bios, and they are both worthy of them, but we'll, we'll keep it kind of brief. Uh, Christopher Hitchens is the author of the best-selling book, God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. A prolific writer and polemicist, he argues that religion is a toxic force that makes the world a more dangerous place. He contributes regularly to Vanity Fair, Slate, and the Atlantic Monthly. And his brilliant and passionate advocacy for the cases, for the causes he believes in, make his writing so compelling. And I have to share with you my favorite blurb uh, in praise of his white writing of this book was from Esquire, which wrote, Thank God for Christopher Hitchens. <laughs> Rabbi David Wolpe is the author of the new book, Why Faith Matters, named the number one rabbi in America by Newsweek magazine. He's the senior rabbi at Sinai Temple in Los Angeles and argues powerfully for the place of God, faith, and religion in modern life. He writes for many publications, including Beliefnet.com, the Jerusalem Post, the LA Times, and we're proud to say the Jewish Week where his weekly musings column is as incisive as it is brief. It's not an easy thing to do as a writer, trust me. So welcome to you both. Now, as far as the format, yes. Uh, each of our speakers will present his views here from the lectern for seven minutes and then we're going to give each of you five minutes to respond. And then, more informally, I plan to ask you some questions and we'll get into a, hopefully, a more free-flowing kind of conversation. We also want to hear from you in the audience, so we set aside time for questions from you in written form. Uh, we've distributed index cards for you to write your questions down. And we have several uh, staffers and others helping us, so you'll see them uh, going through the aisles, collecting cards, and um, they'll bring them up to me. So I urge you to keep your questions brief. That's why we provided you with index cards. Um, and legible, as penmanship counts. Uh, and at the end of the program, we will have Rabbi Wolpe and Mr. Hitchens uh, each give us a three-minute summation for their final remarks. So for those of you keeping track of, of time, we will, we will conclude before 9.15. And at that point, uh, following the program, everyone is invited to join us for a reception downstairs 
in the Wise, in Wise Hall, and copies of the author's books will be on sale there, and they've graciously agreed to sign them for you. We also have copies of the Jewish Week and some of our other publications, so we hope you'll join us after the program. Uh, my final request uh, is to please turn off your cell phones. Thank you. Sure. And we begin with Christopher Hitchens. Thank you. Uh, shalom. Um, I thought I had been to the largest uh, Jewish temple in the world, uh, the, uh, the shul in Budapest, where uh, Theodor Herzl uh, once used to attend. But I'm told that, and I now believe it, that this one uh, outranks it. The last one I went to, because usually I don't go into houses of worship unless I'm wearing about a ton of garlic around my neck, uh, was, the, was the very tiny temple on the Tunisian island of Gerba the foundation stone of which is said to have come from the original temple itself, uh, a, a wonderful gem, little gem of a, of a synagogue, um, blown up uh, in 2003 by Al-Qaeda, but recently uh, repaired uh, along with its tenacious community. So comparing and contrasting that miniature and that grandiosity I'm very glad to find myself this evening speaking in what appears to my disordered senses to be the dining room of Hogwarts School. <laughs> though, though I dare say I couldn't have picked a less apt uh, name for a, a Jewish house of worship. Uh, I also have a question, just before we start, I'd like everyone to put up their hands. Who knows why the World Series is called the World Series? One, and she could be wrong. Um, feverishly, for years, I asked when I arrived here as an immigrant from England, why do they call it the World Series? No one else in the world plays this game except Canada, the Dominican Republic, Cuba, and I think Japan. How do they call it the World Series? No one can tell me why it's called the World Series. And no one here can either. This thing, why not? It's our game. Naturally, it's the World Series. And we're the world champions at it. The New York World, ladies and gentlemen, used to sponsor this series, a now defunct newspaper. That's why it's called the World Series. It could have been called the Post Series. It could have been called the Newsday Series. I just a warning against hubris before we start, and against man-made reification and myth of the sort that can turn into something rather dangerous, morally and intellectually, which brings me to my theme. When I was looking for a subtitle for my book, God is Not Great, I thought, let's not be sensational, let's not be catch penny, let's not be cheap, but let's, let's try and get people's attention. I thought God is Not Great might do that already. I called it How Religion, Why Religion Poisons Everything. I knew what would happen. People would say, what, everything? What, you mean chess? Uh, you mean tantric sex? You mean tourism, it poisons everything? Well, in a way, as I've gone on with this debate, and as I persist in it tonight, and as I will tomorrow, I would be more and more willing, ever more willing to defend myself in saying that it's a universal toxin from which nothing is exempt. First, I believe and I maintain that it attacks us in our very deepest integrity, in, our, in, the, in the core of our self-respect. Religion says that we would not know right from wrong. We would not know an evil, wicked act from a decent human act uh, without divine permission or without divine authority or without, even worse, either the fear of divine punishment or the hope of a divine reward. It, it, it strips us of the right to make our own determination as all humans always have.